Welcome to the On the Water podcast. I'm Andy Dombreski. Today we're joined by Kevin Blinkoff and my old friend, Carl Johansson. And when I say old friend, Carl, how old are you now? I will be 79 in a few more months. 79 years young. You're doing well. It's good to see you. As actually, always. actually, I'll be 89. Will you really? Yeah. I was going to say, but... Yeah. <laughs> I'm closer to 90 than I am 70 now. So you really are an old friend. Yeah. And... Um, me and Carl kind of go way back, for me anyways, it's way back. We met, it was probably about 30 years ago. Yeah. I had just graduated college. Um, I was got my first job out of college in Falmouth down in the Cape. I was commuting from Pembroke every day and crossing over the Cape Cod Canal and started fishing it. Really kind of got into the canal scene, you know, before and after work. And actually landed a part-time job at Roy's Bait and Tackle, which a lot of people probably today aren't familiar with. But it was one of the bigger shops on the canal. Uh, it was down towards the railroad bridge on the Cape side, uh, owned by a gentleman named Roy Brower, who I've lost touch of. I don't know if you've heard anything. Yeah, he's still, he's still uh, alive. I... Uh, ran into him about two years ago. He was still doing okay. Oh, good. That's good. Yeah, I've always wondered. Um, I've seen his sons, Johan and Chris, I believe was their name. Right. Um, he used to work in the shop occasionally, too. But um, Carl worked there part-time. I worked there part-time, and we, we got to know each other. And Carl really taught me a lot when I was younger. You know, it was kind of right when the striped bass were sort of making a comeback. And um, I was really getting into it and fishing as much as I could, and I basically just worked there so I could get the discount on tackle and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, I was going through a lot of pogies, and back then, that was the big thing on the canal. Like, right. people, there was people plugging, but the main way people were fishing, when I started fishing it, it was all chunking pogies. You'd right. go, you'd get your cooler full of pogies, you'd probably get 30, 40 pogies, you know, buck a piece, 50 cents a piece. you go down to the canal, you get a nice big old chum slick going, and after you got your slick going, you'd throw a chunk on and you'd free spool it on a conventional reel. You know, the new conventional reel was the, the hot ticket, um, seven and a half, eight foot rod. And that was kind of the, the main way that people fish the canal. And I don't think I've seen somebody chunking a pogey in the canal in the past 10 years. I haven't um, either. And I'm sure, you know, you've seen many more changes than what I've seen in 30 years. Um, when did you start fishing the canal? I started fishing the canal right around 1942. Uh, and I was, I, I was born in 34. I would say I was probably 12 or 13 years old when uh, my mentor at the time uh, brought me down here uh, to fish to keep me out of trouble. And uh, the, uh, the fishing at that time was mainly early in the morning on a breaking tide, throwing either Adams or a uh, Gibbs out on breaking fish that were chasing at that time uh, what we call silvers, silver hay, whiting in some cases. Um, and I was down at Blackie's Hole which is down behind the uh, ice skating rink. And we would arrive anywhere from one or two o'clock in the morning after a long drive from Roxbury, where I, uh, I had to hold the rods. I didn't have a rod. I was just uh, a schlepper at the time. I was, I was earning my, my right to fish, and, my, and I had to be his helper. I had, uh, Peter Coaches, my mentor, was a, was a, a person. He didn't drink, he didn't uh, smoke, and he just was discharged from the army. Uh, and he had been in serving his country and was was uh, honorably discharged. And he took me under his wing, and uh, would bring me down there to Blackie's Hall. We would arrive after we'd stop at Red Top and pick a few wheels skins up and. He taught me how to uh, put a skin rig on. And if I didn't do it right, I heard about it. And for years, he would always use 
buy three skins, put, I'd rig them up. He'd lo- lose them. I never once saw him catch a fish on an eel skin rig. <laughs> never once. But on a plug, he was deadly. I mean, they all loaded the uh, Gibbs plugs. They were loaded up to four ounces. And he would, they would cast out along with the, the Black family, and there was, they were a rather large family. They had three, four brothers and a, and a sister, and they camped out behind what we call Blackie's Hole all summer. They had a campsite set up, and they were there all summer long, and the Army Corps never knew they were there, or they wouldn't have lasted long. And we had a trail that went from the campsite right to where we fished, now, also used to be a heron run right there. Hmm. And if they needed heron, even though the heron didn't stay in any place, they would always come in here as a false river type thing, and then they would go back out. We always had some bait available if they wanted a live line heron, which I didn't see them do too much. But my job mainly was to carry all the gear down, and if we caught fish, carry all the fish back, uh, and when they had fish on, I, my job was to go down and bring the fish up onto the roadway because they all fished off the roadway at the time. They didn't fish down on the rocks because that was dangerous. And what was the what was the gear like? The rods and reels? Well, uh, back then they they mostly used Hanels. Uh, they had squitters mostly, all squitters, one forties. Um, so those that use a spinning rod, a spinning reel, would be a uh, the Luxa, yeah. mm-hmm. or, or the uh, 302 Mitchells. Oh yeah. All right, real noisy. It's classic. Yeah. yeah, real noisy reels, uh, but they had they had those reels so perfected at that time. The guys that used them, they could all hit the middle of the canal with no problems. I don't know how they did it then, but when you've seen the size of some of these gentlemen that I'm talking about, they were well over 6'5", and they had, they had a little weight on their side. They had, they had the dynamics and physicalities to make that happen, where I, and even as a kid, I could never do that. And, uh, but I, I would think that given yesterday and you know, and, and all of the transformations that I went through, uh, I started with a split bamboo rod. My first rod after I think it was two years of being a helper, I finally became uh, accepted by the group as as a fisherman. And and that all happened, if you don't mind, it, it all happened uh, one one early morning after a long night. I fell asleep. He had. And my friend used to give me his weight as to wear or it was hip boots. I think it was hip boots at the time. And I I fell asleep because we had left the, we had left Roxbury about eleven o'clock. We stopped at Red Top. Got, uh, Red Top always had a cup of coffee going, uh, even though I didn't drink coffee or anything at that time. But you know, get the latest news from Bunny DePietro. Bunny was a great guy. And um, one, of, one, of the, one of the true gentlemen of fishing the Cape Cod Canal was Bunny DePietro, I'd have to say that. And we would, uh, I woke up uh, b- by something that was inside my hip boots and it happened to be a rat, <laughs> and, which we used to see all the time. Uh, at that time, the rats were all over the place. You, could, you couldn't, even in the middle of the daytime, you couldn't get away without seeing some activity from these creatures. And I woke, it woke me up and I screamed and uh, Peter came over to me and he says, what happened, are you all right? I says, yeah, I'm all right. And then Bob Black came over, make sure I was all right, to make sure the rat didn't bite me. He says, well, now you're an official official canal rat. You, you understand what we're saying to you? We, I didn't know at the time. He said, that was, that's the way they were indoctrinated into the canal at that time. To become a canal rat meant more than just putting in your time. 
You actually had to have a rat crawl over you <laughs> while you were sleeping, which most guys did early in that time frame. They, yeah. You know, a long night, they would fall asleep. And in some cases, uh, they were drinking, which didn't help things. Uh, and that's what made it good for me because my mentor didn't at the time. And uh, it, it, it kind of guided me along the way of this, my life. And we, we would get to a stage in that period uh, that in order to be a fisherman, you had to drink. And that's one of the things when I first started that I tried to set an example way back when I was a young kid, that if I get into this stage of where um, those that fish do not need to drink to become fishermen, all right? And that's where I, I started that process mm -hmm. in my lifetime because fishing has saved my life, all right? And if because of fishing, I'm, I'm sitting here today with many accomplishments that I would have never done had it not been for fishing. And so for me, uh, those early days were comforting uh, because it kept me alive, among other things. And I can, you go on and relate today, uh, you know, we went through the transformation of uh, fishing f with plugs, and then we would come down to Papanesset We'd stop at the heron runs along the way. Uh, he had he had two heron runs. He w it was his favorite heron runs to get heron, and one of them was uh, in Mashby. And uh, we would stop on the way down to Papanesset and just pick up enough bait and head out to Papanesset and or South Cape Beach, one of those two places, and chunk the, chunk them on the bottom, and then. That was the day, yeah. You know, so. But I can say every time that we I went in those early times, that my friend mentor at the time. I carried more thirty pound plus fish than I've ever carried. Yeah. Mm. During those times, because all those fish were all big, and I don't know why, they would break underneath the the Bourne Bridge right down the middle. They come down and. At daybreak, they sound like 20, you know, like 20 gauge shotguns going off. Boom, boom. With, you know, chasing the bait. The bait would fly up in the air, and you'd see a fish come out of the water, try to grab it. And, uh, and then another one from another side, and they would split, split the fish in half, you know, trying to catch it. They didn't break the fish, but that's the way the activity went. Yeah. And my, my first experience of catching a fish uh, was when I was real young, which was like my third year of, of being mentored. He, he let me borrow a, uh, a rod. I had saved enough money to get a squitter. And a squitter at that time was fair traded at $25 which meant you had to pay $25 for this pen reel. But I found a place in New York that it cost me $14.99. And that's what I did. I, I sent the, my money plus shipping, and I wound up with a pen squitter. And my first experience was he let me take one of his plugs and cast on a breaking fish. The fish came up. He's standing there telling me when, when to lock it up and when not to lock it up. And I got this plug gone. I got the fish running. He finally says, okay, lock it up. I lock it up. And when I lock it up, I lose my position on the rock. I go in the water. The fish had dropped the plug. I'm in the, in the water bobbing like a cork. And my friend was so big. He picked me up, grabbed me by the back of my neck, and lifted me right out of the water. That was my first experience. Wow. Yeah. All right? Of fishing the canal. And I've had a bunch later, uh, you know, that were something similar that cost me some time fishing and some bones getting repaired. But, you know, that's normal when you're fishing on the canal. The rocks are never firm. 
They're always, if you go on a wreck, no matter how firm you think it is, it's not. It's, it's, it's going to move. You just got to be very cautious of where you fish. That's why I, today I can only fish in some places because your balance is, when you're young, the balance is there. When you get older, the balance is not there. And you have to be more careful as you get older because the bones take longer to heal. So yeah. yeah, it certainly is a dangerous place to fish. And it's it like is. you said, because the rocks are unstable. And uh, a few years ago I was there, I actually saw a guy wearing a helmet and I kind of laughed at him at first, you know, but then I got to thinking after I slipped and almost fell about five times, like, that's actually not a bad idea. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it's an easy place to get hurt. Yeah. Well, I, I have a, I can relate to that. I have my brother-in-law who actually passed as a result of falling in the canal and really? hit his head. And uh, I have my other good friend. He can't walk anymore because of the same type of a thing. And um, we used to fish down at the Iron Works, which is uh, where the refueling area is. Mm -hmm. for, and for many years, there was only a few of us that knew the, the size of the fish that came out of that place. And um, he, he strictly a catch and release type guy. And he caught a nice fish, went down uh, to release it. And on the way back up, he slipped and fell backwards and bumped his head all the way down to the water. And then six months later, you know, they, they carried him out in the ambulance. That's why you have to be, I mentioned that. It's, it's important for people to remember safety is one of your priorities yeah. that you have to be always aware of. Yeah, especially a low tide too. Those oh, rocks yeah. get greasy, and uh, right. you know, unless you get on one with barnacles, you're, right. you, you're hanging on for dear life to get your balance in there. Yeah. Balance, as you, as you get older, you find that your balance is not as good as it was when you're young. And even though my heart is still on the rocks, I can't go there anymore. Yeah. Because I, I, know, I know what that feeling like. You know, yeah, I've sort of given up on fishing it just because you know I live in Falmouth. We have sandy beaches. Right. Give me a nice sandy beach any day. You know, I'm probably not going to catch as big of a fish or maybe as many a fish, but it's for me, it's a better experience than uh, absolutely dancing and, around on those slimy the, and, rocks. And the thing here is, during those time frames, we used to fish for all species of fish in the canal. The canal had scup that we fished on, sea bass we fished on, fluke, flounder, pollock, smelt, during specific times of the year. We're all available. Not like today where you might have some scup, you might have some sea bass, and you will have striped bass. So everybody's concentrated their efforts on one species of fish, which eventually is not a good thing. Sure. And and the people that are fishing there don't understand that these other species are still available, but you have to work to find them. Yeah. But they are there. Yeah. I know they're there. You're just gonna lose some tackle to get them. You gotta change your approach. You gotta do a little experimentation, but you gotta get down there on the low water to mm -hmm, do yeah. it. You know, that's when you find out the, the specific areas within the canal that you can catch these species yeah. you mentioned pollock that's something i really haven't seen or heard of in the canal in, a, in as long as i've been fishing it for the last 15 20 years what was the pollock fishing like the pollock fishing was fast and furious really and it and when we had the same time when we had the codfish there we would get the pollock the pollock sometimes were not as large as the codfish but in the spring when the pollock all got up into schooling they would all be nice big fish. Hmm. And my last time was probably 12 years ago. I was uh, jigging down at the Ironworks in one of my favorite places that had some nice fish. I hooked a pollock that was about 10 pounds. It was the last hmm. one I've ever, I've ever seen. But in the, when we used to fish in the fall for mackerel, it was a good time also. We would get the small um, hava hava. Yeah, pollock. I've seen those caught when, right. like you said, when people were mackerel fishing right. of the bulkhead at the east right. end. And that um, was always. I've never seen a large. No, in, in the last number of years, 
there hasn't been any harbor pollock in there, which mm. is a, which which to me is a problem. Is this it's telling you something? But sure, I, you know. Yeah, let's back up too. You mentioned smelt. Yes, um, I've heard that people used to get them. Where would you fish in the Sandwich Marina? Is that where yes. you? Would? We used to go down on the docks of the Sandwich Marina, and uh, bring our lanterns down there and fish at night. We had to get permission. We would fish off the back side of the entrances uh, sometimes, but the floats were the best when they were there. Yeah, and they were they, most of the time they were only there for a short period of time. Then they were gone. And what time of year was that? That was in the fall. In the fall. Uh, you know, it's somewhere around. Thanksgiving, somewhere yeah. in that area, and uh, they would show up. They were migrating through the canal, and they would use that as a, a resting spot. Gotcha. All right. Uh, just like, believe it or not, today, when the bass are around, they use it for a resting spot as well. Yep. When you go out of the Sandwich Marina and you look at your chart, sometimes, You'll see some big marks on the bottom. Those are all striped bass sitting there waiting. Yeah, already. it's like when they dug that canal, they custom made it for habitat for a striped bass. It's right. just perfect. A lot of current, right. a lot of big rocks where they can duck out of the current. You're right. You, know, you got a lot of you know lobsters. You got a lot of crabs. You got fish. It's just um, if you could design a spot for striped bass, right? That, that would be is exactly how you would make right. it. Right, because like the Cape Cod Canal, deep water. Exactly. Steep banks, a lot of current. Right, and when the when the water would flow out, the bass would sit right on the edges and wait for them. They didn't have to move. Yeah. They just sat there. Um, the ironworks where, where the water came out of the power plant was also another place. They would stay there all winter. Yeah. All the way up in the back. And uh, I used to feed two or three 50 pound plus fish every time I went down. Yeah. I never tried to catch them. I always, you know, just sit there to watch them, throw some feed and they'd, they'd take it and then they would scoop back up inside. I made the mistake of telling that to one person that I didn't know was selling fish. Yeah. And he went up inside at night with a hundred pound rope you know, that's what I call it. It's a hand line, codfish line, with hook. And he put used to use squid. And he, he pulled them all out and sold them. And after that, it was. He caught yeah. your pets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, you know, he caught my pets. And my friend Bob Small, he uh, he and I used to have a lot of fun doing that. You know. Yeah. Sometimes we would fish underneath. You know the walkway that goes over. There would be some small fish in there. And we got so we could sling sling the bait and let it skip across the top of the water and get it eight, ten feet underneath the road and just let it sit there. All right? And when it started to move, you had to be you had to set the hook before they started going the wrong way. Because if they started to go up high, they would take the line and break it right off underneath the bridge abutment. But if yep. they came out in front of you, you had to hold Cape Cod Canal and fight them. So, but I, I think I think that, you know, those are, those are they, the bass use that as a resting area as well. Yeah. They would come up in there. Matter of fact, if you ever, even now today, if you look at those two draw-ins that are on either side, where it's all high fenced, there's holes in the eye in there. If you concentrate and look straight down on a while well, in during the summertime, you'll see the bass come right through those holes and sit right in there until they decide that they want to go back out. Yeah, I always got the impression that when the tide was really moving, the bass would just camp out in one spot and they'd all have their little holes that they'd sit in and then on the slack tide they would kind of move around resettle exactly exactly um so i used to tell people you know the tide's moving you should be moving too just keep moving 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 right. don't stand in one spot and keep casting because you know the fish aren't moving around a lot when the when the current's yep. ripping so the more mobile you are in that window the more more you your chance, odds of encountering yeah, I mean, a feeding fish increase 
One, one of the things that I learned early on, because I love jigging, I, I believe that jigs still outdo plugs, but that's another yeah. story. But the thing here is I, I like the jig because I can walk with them. I call them walking my jig. If I'm running west, the water's running west, and I get up at the power plant, for example, I can get on that, there's one stretch so it's all open. I can begin at the beginning of it, get the jig on the bottom and just walk with it. Walk all the way straight down to where I had to stop and turn around and come back again. But I would let the jig bounce off the bottom while I was walking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was always uh, a better productive situation. Yeah, you're getting more time in the zone by right. doing that. And you always caught some fish. Um, but when you're dead sticking, you know, which you can do in the canal, a lot of people don't realize, you can fish the canal on the bottom with less than an ounce of weight if you know where to go. Yeah. There are locations where the water will, you throw into a current and underneath the current is a backwash, and you have to watch that backwash, and then the backwash would come and settle right in a hole, and just let it sit there with the short rod. Mm -hmm. We used to use the same rod for live line, and that you mentioned, uh, to chunk, yep. you know, bait. And uh, if, you, if you looked for the currents, where the currents were, and you, you, you would, soon find out which way the backwash was. At the bottom of those backwashes, there was fish sitting. They're magnets, yep. And they were from here to that wall mm. when they would hit. Yeah. There's locations where the water goes straight down. Most people let a plug into they never see that. Yeah. Because they don't, they're just looking out here. But right underneath their feet are some places that the fish will congregate and, and you can have some nice luck. You don't always bring them in, but you'll catch them. Yeah, I think it was you that told me this. I could have been somebody else, but as you're going along the canal, you'll notice almost like a white, it's not a picket fence, but you'll see a, a white fence with two posts, might be 10 feet long and they're sporadic you know it's maybe every quarter mile you see one of these but i was told those mark um like tunnels that come into the canal that are mm -hmm. drainage pipes wherever one of those is there'll be a hole immediately in front of it um and i know there's one on the sagamore bridge on the mainland side um that i used to fish quite a bit um, but there's so many subtle nuances of fish in the canal. Oh, you absolutely. Can, every time you go, you learn right. something new. And um, no, it, it really is a complicated place to fish. If you're first getting into fishing, absolutely, it's I, not I, necessarily I, the easiest place to go. But I would say as long as I've been fishing the canal, and it's over 75 years now, I have never, ever learned all of the nuances that the canal offers all of the challenges, all of the experiences, and a lot of them, mostly good, some bad. But the thing here is, overall, there's no, as far as I'm concerned, there's no one expert when it comes to fishing the canal. Yeah. Because you all have to figure out the best way that you want to fish. Throwing a plug, throwing jigs, throwing bait. But until you learn all three in, in the best experience on learning how the canal is, is to go with bait yeah. first. And drifting, drifting the areas that you want to fish, jigging and learn how to jig because everybody looks at it, the jig's got to bounce off the bottom. Well, that's true. But in some places, it's not true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it all depends on how close you get to some of the hidden treasures that are down underneath the canal that people don't even know exist. You know, for example, in front of the Heron Run, there's the remains of a boat, hmm. all right? And you have to find that, and you can jig along the edges and, 
it's still, you know, what's left. And you've got plenty, plenty of uh, muscle beds. Yep. And how you run that jig or run that bait that close to the area where it is before you retrieve it and not get hung up, that, that takes a little learning. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to lose gear in the canal, no matter how good they are at some point. Yeah, that's why there's 10 tackle shops along it. <laughs> right, that's why there's so many shops along it. You're right. Today's episode of the On the Water podcast is brought to you by Old Town Canoe and Kayaks. Old Town has been making the finest canoes and kayaks for over 120 years, right on the banks of the Penobscot River in Maine. Their line of sportsman fishing kayaks has options for every angler, fresh and salt, inshore and offshore, and they come in paddle, pedal, and power versions. I'm a huge fan of saltwater kayak fishing, and I absolutely love my Old Town Sportsman Big Water 132 pedal kayak. It's big enough to take offshore and out in open water, but it's nimble enough for fishing inshore in the backwaters. Plus, it's super stable. I am totally comfortable standing up in my kayak, fly fishing for striped bass. I also use it to bottom fish for black sea bass and to tog. In the fall, I take it out on the water almost every day to chase false albacore. Absolutely my favorite fish to chase from the kayak. So if you're looking to get into kayak fishing or if you're maybe already a kayak fishing addict and you're just looking to upgrade, I highly recommend checking out the Old Town Sportsman line of kayaks. You can take a look online at oldtowncanoe.com slash on the water. Once again, that's oldtowncanoe.com slash on the water. Check them out. Now, back in those early years, you obviously take, coming down from Roxbury, you did a lot of trips to the canal. Did you ever venture beyond the canal and fish any of the beaches, head to other areas of Cape Cod? Yes. Uh, I can tell you one of the first things I did later was we used to, we used to start our cod fishing in the fall every year down along the uh, Scusset Beach, uh, right, right up next to the jetty. Oh, wow. So right at the east end of the canal. Right at the east end of the canal. And that was start around Thanksgiving, because on Thanksgiving, depending on the wind and everything, it marked my first day of cod fishing in, in, for the wintertime. After, after Thanksgiving dinner came, I would pack all my stuff and either go, we'd either go down, Bob Small and I either go down to there at the Scusset end on the beaches, or we'd go down to Castle Island. Which is in Boston Harbor. Yeah, and fish the Boston area. It depend, you know, it might be, it might have been Hull, it could be off Duxbury, we fished off the piers of Duck, you know, the, the Duxbury uh, Road Bridge. Bridge. But, I did very little fishing uh, down at the West End at the time. Mm -hmm. The big, the big place, the big to do around Bell Road. When when I was mentored, my friend uh, would take us in, just down there, and he would never stay there, even if they were catching fish. He just said, you know, it had a bad reputation. Yeah, that's all I can say, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he didn't want to have any part of it at that time. And that was early. So later it changed and then later it changed again. You know, these areas come and go. Um, there was one area uh, which we call um, the Lupus, which is behind, uh, well, it was real, no, real close to Red Top, but it's on the left down behind where they're, right where they're making those new condominiums, right in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a place that they used to fish, all right? And they mostly, uh, you know, they did their stuff, but they were all good fishermen, and they all respected the resource, no matter how they got, you know, and yeah. you couldn't fish with them unless you respected the resource. Why was it called the lepers? Uh, uh, because they were a motley group of uh, they, <laughs> the they characters liked, that fished there. <laughs> yeah, they uh, they all imbibed in both cigarettes, drinking, and drugs. Yeah, not not a hundred percent of them, but mostly. And it, they had they had quite a few guys, and uh, the one I can't think of his name right now, but the gentleman that set it all up. He had so many that they wanted to become part of this group 
that he went to Red Sox and he went to uh, a few other st stores, shops down here. He says, if my guys come in and they say they're part of the lepers, I want you to give them a 10% discount on their fishing gear. And Red Sox agreed. Hmm. A couple of the others didn't. So the word was, if you need stuff, you go to Red Sox. Don't go to these other shops. So that's good. You know, so he's the first one that started. That was that group that started yeah. the Red Cops discount yeah. for those that are VI important people. Right. All right. The lepers. <laughs> the lepers. All right, of all. And, they, you know, but I used to fish with them. I never became one. They won't, but I used to fish with them, especially down at South Cape Beach. And they'd be talking to a group, part of them, that were over in the vineyard fishing. And they'd be back and forth. And um, I, I enjoyed, you know, the fact that you'd go down to their encampment on the canal. They, they also were set up, like the blacks were, the Bob Black family. They had their campers, they were set up. Nobody bothered them. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's all a right. free for all. And they kept the area clean, all right? And if you came down there and you left your stuff, they would say, hey, pick that up. And if you said whatever you said to them, and they would pick you up and say, you know what? you got two choices. Either you're going in the water or you're going to put that in the bag. Yeah. So you take, make the decision right now what you're going to do. Because we don't fish down here like we don't leave. We leave this place better than we find it every time we come. Yeah. So, and, and they had a good philosophy that way, and that's why I like fishing with them. I didn't like the other part, but that's yeah. life. That's yeah, so another interesting part of the Cape Cod Canal is the names for the various spots. And um, I think there's a lot of history there that a lot of people aren't familiar with. Um, I'd be curious if you know, you know, some of the stories be behind the names. You know, you got Murderer's uh, Row and... You know, I, would, I, would, I would tell you this. My, my, back in those times, they didn't like the idea of, of uh, telling you what pole you were fishing at. Yeah. You could not mention the pole number. So somebody devised a way of, in my opinion, of getting around that by assigning a name to them, like Pip's Rip, Blackie's Hole, uh, Puttingy Hole, um, and they all, you know, High Bank, uh, Grossman's, Grossman's, there was two, yeah, there was two Grossman's on the canal, there was one on each side. One they called, if you knew, you thought, you know, the, the one that was on the mainland side was called Grossman's, but there was a Grossman's on our side of the canal, but they call that the Lumber Yard. Yeah. All right, just so, and if you knew that, if you fished in that group, then you would know the difference, but if you didn't, you'd be looking yeah, no or clue. whatever, but but Portuguese Hall became real fans, real famous during the cod, because there was one of the only places that inside you could catch them on a you know drifting. Um, we used to use a three-way swivel rig with a sand deal, a fake sand deal on it, all right, and just drift drift it up mm -hmm. or down, but. It, my a philosophical thing that I have found out over the years, if there's a spot on this side of the canal that's good, there's another one right across from it. You just gotta find it. Yeah. All right. And that's and it was through cod fishing that I was able to discover that. Because there were times I would go down to Portuguese Hole, you couldn't get a spot to fish. So we would cross the Sagamore Bridge and go down the other side and get right up in the first, second, third light pole in that area. Yep. And we, especially when it was running east and get get it so it would come back underneath the Sagamore Bridge, which is which is still a good place for striped bass today. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. And I, I'm a firm believer on letting the line go no matter what you have on and even a plug if there's room letting it go and, and then working it back because the edges of the canal are always productive when the fish are around. But you just can't 
afford to interfere uh, with somebody else's right to fish, which is one thing that, you know, I was taught, you know, you get on a spot, it's yours, as far as I can cast left, right, or straight ahead. And anybody that wanted to fish next to me would have to ask me, and they have to be using the same outfit that if I was jigging, they'd have to be jigging. If I was bait fishing and, and just drift fishing, they would have to be. But today, it don't make any difference. They have no... Yeah, etiquette is dead. It, yeah, right. It <laughs> just, keep collecting. You know, everybody wants to, wants to have it. They make a big cluster. And, you know, we had clusters when, when, when we were heron fishing with, with heron, live heron, especially at the heron run. Oh, my. Yeah, I remember that. That's when I first started oh. fishing there in May into June. Yeah. That was the spot to be. And, it, we, yeah, you'd be... Elbow to elbow down there because you were getting the herring right out of the right. run. Um, the contraptions people had made up to move the herring. You see guys with hand trucks oh. with live wells, and you know everybody had the herring baskets, which were made out of a clothes basket. Yep, you're right. You put some burlap on the top, and you, I still have mine. I still got one too in my basement, and hoping someday it'll be able to use it again. But I probably never will. And you'd have styrofoam, and you'd float that out in front of you. Right. And you keep your 12 herring in that. And, yeah. Uh, See, was... those, during those time frames when we had the heron live lining with the baskets, even though it became a real cluster, it was still safer than the way they're doing it today with these plugs. Yeah, it was civilized because your bait wasn't going that far. You know, right. The herring might swim right. 30 feet out. It wasn't. And they were respectful. If you got a fish on, they would let you fight that fish yeah, and bring it in before the they flip the heron out again. Today, they, you know, for me, they they see somebody on a fish. Oh, they they want to they want to catch the same fish you're on, and so they make it harder. And and you get people that get hooked because they're not careful. And and I've taken a few hooks out of people, but it's always on their hands, never on their face or head like we've been getting lately. Yeah, and that's dangerous. But uh, I, I would, the fish piers, as far as in the fall, when the mackerel came in, they would get real crowded too. Yeah. But everybody was respectful of each, each person that was there. And if you got a load on, and the load could be six mackerel on a rig, it's hard to fight. You know, six mm -hmm. mackerel, even, I, I can't handle any more than three now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, I mean, we used to, you know, used to fill up, we make our own jigs, you know, yeah. our own rigs, and, and we hook them up. And uh, sometimes, you know, early on, we used to catch them on the top, so you didn't use a lot of weight to get through it. And then lately, the last bunch of years, I catch them right on the bottom. I just let it roll along the bottom. Yeah. I let it sit, roll, roll, and just hold the rod, bop, 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 bop. And that's typically like a November bite when you get Yeah, the November, and December, and even January sometimes. That late, yeah. It all depends. You know, it all depends on the fish. They get finicky, and they, for some reason this year, there was a lot of fish, a lot of mackerel, but they stayed way off. They yeah. stayed, you know, they stayed out in the, Stellwagen area, and they didn't really come in for some reason, but hopefully this year they'll come in. We touched on cod from shore, okay, uh, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. It's still kind of a, a mystique, especially among younger anglers, um, and you do very occasionally hear of somebody actually getting one, but it's almost unheard of these days. Right. But you're one of the few people that I've talked to that kind of fished through the heyday of the cod from shore. Um, and whether it ever comes back remains to be seen, but it's not looking good. Um, but i just like to talk about like the locations where you used to do that. You mentioned Scusset, but I know the Outer Cape was also a big spot for that. The Outer Cape uh, in the springtime was good. All right, mm -hmm. and the guys that had the little little boats attached to the top of their yep. vehicles to go out in the race, 
they would load those boats up hmm. to the to the gunnels with pollock and, and codfish and, and big ones. Um, we didn't have that uh, blessing uh, sort, you know, everything we did was walking. Uh, we carried two rods with us and we would fish, we would start sometimes, like I say, at Scusset. We would work our way down uh, along the beaches all the way up into Boston Harbor. And Hull was one place I, we used to fish behind the high school and Hull Gut. Yeah, we think that would be, it's deep water. It was deep water, had to move. It was, and it, it's also a very productive spot for bluefish yeah. for a period of time. And it was striped bass, but it was the codfish that brought me there more than anything. And uh, we used to have uh, the Sugar Bowl in Castle Island. The Sugar Bowl used to, at one time back and before the hurricane of 38 took it down, used to have a covered bridge going out to it where everybody fished for mackerel. And that's why today it's a good mackerel place. But um, we used to fish the Sugar Bowl. And I would have to take the streetcar and the bus, uh, and it wasn't fun. But at first, I started fishing for silver, silver hake there, and I was, I was probably ten or eleven at the time. So that's around 40, 1942, 43, 44. Same time I started fishing with my friend. But I used to go out as a kid. It was safe. Yeah. All right. Uh, I could uh, get there and uh, get to the sugar bowl. Uh, I would either dig my bait if I could, or I'd have to buy it later on. I had to, I bought more more of my and I fished with a, a friend of mine uh, that uh, that uh, lived in South Boston, and we used to fish together and go out. And in the course of the night, uh, we would. We, we would get 8, 10, 15 codfish, and we would select the fish we would take. Yeah. And we had a limit. They had to be at least 10 pounds hmm. at that so time. So you're getting some decent size. They oh. had to be decent size. And I had, I had made a gaff. Uh, this is late. This is in the 60s. I, I would bring out this long gaff, and I was the official gaffer for all, not hmm. only the Sugar Bowl, but the Castle Island when I went out. Because I had another kind of a gaff for the, to pull up. And, and was this, you said, through the night, was this mostly nighttime fishing in the this dark? This was all nighttime fishing, okay. hmm. except until in the springtime. Mm -hmm. And one other place, we used to fish the haunt, the rocks of the haunt, in the daytime. Mm -hmm. And that was always on a Sunday. I'm just, I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> that was my church. Uh, but anyway, fishing the sugar bowl, we had... We had one spot we used to fish, and we would we would fish from four o'clock in the afternoon until five o'clock the next morning. We would fish nine or eight, ten hours. It all depended on the circumstances. And the worse the weather was, the more the fish were. <laughs> they were just there, and they had their mouths open. And uh, I met. I met a, uh, one of the world's famous wrestlers there, Killer Kowalski, and uh, he, he used to get driven out there with his wife or whatever it was in his long Cadillac. He'd come out there and take his two rods out and fish. And uh, one, one winter he brought out three midget wrestlers, and they did their routine for everybody, and they all, they all got a stand and all. I mean, it was two or three inches of snow on the ground, and they did it across the, the rock pile there, doing their dance. And uh, and then he he f liked to fish alone. He was a very, I don't know how you call it. Quiet. Huh? Quiet. No, no he wasn't quiet. He, 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 wanted, he wanted the peace and comfort of fishing, yeah. mm -hmm. all right, because of what he, the business that he was in. And I never talked to him about wrestling. All right, never talked to him about wrestling. But I, I can account uh, that he was a big man, he was strong, he loved to fish. And we used to be out on Castle Island. And just to give you an idea, we were on Castle Island fishing one night, 
he shows up and he says, how's my friend Carl? I says, fine, how's my friend? And he goes he go all the way down to the end of the pier to be by himself. All the rest of us are on this end. I had my windbreaker up. We got a fire in a 55 gallon bucket to keep us warm. And he'd go all the way down the end and fish. And, you know, he, he didn't care if he was talking to anybody because he was talking to somebody, but I wasn't one of us. And he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, and, you know, he just was one of the fish. So we're down here one night, and two kids come out, and he started giving them, they went all down, they started giving him a hard time. And I went down to him, I says, look, I says, you don't want to mess with him. I says, he doesn't know, he doesn't, you don't know who he is. He went all in and they started giving me the whole stuff. I says, hey, look. I says, I'm just telling you, don't mess with them, all right? And I went back fishing. And I looked down, and the next thing I know, I heard him say, I've already asked you in a nice way to leave me alone. I just come down here to fish. Oh, okay. And they started on him again. So he put his rod down, the two kids are in front of him, he grabbed one each by the throat and lifted them up over the railing on the pier. And they're out over in the water, if he ever let them go, they would have been dead. He says, he says, I'm asking you politely to please leave me alone. Put them back on the pier and you never saw two guys pick up and take <laughs> off so fast. They got so fast, they left their bait there. I went down to him. I says, hey, here's some more bait to fish with. <laughs> and I never forgot that night. Yeah, probably never saw those kids again. I never saw them again. <laughs> and I used to fish down here all the time. Even when the, even when the hurricane took it down in 80-something. Um, but anyway... Carl, if you don't, I'm going to just jump to another kind of topic here. You we've, you and I have talked before about um, mentorship and passing on fishing to the younger generation. I see you've got your shirt on here, you know, master urban angler, instructor. Being a mentor and teaching fishing has been really important to you. You also mentioned that fishing saved your life. But as you were talking, I'm thinking your mentor, um, Peter, who you've mentioned, really, he kind of saved your life in introducing you to fishing. What, what, do you, what, what do you think led Peter to become your mentor? What did he see and, and what made him decide to take you fishing? Because I was a real pain in the end. <laughs> uh, because when he ever, he, you know, when, when he t took me fishing, I'd already been fishing. Mm -hmm. And I already started that initial, I hate to tell you how many times I was in Castle Island by myself all night for two days in a row praying. All right, I mean that was that was before I met Peter. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyways, um, he, I, he had a store. His father, his father sold um, vegetables in Roxbury out of a store he had, and he used to run the local uh, poker game. And then he, he, when he, when he went into the service, he came out and he bought a store and he was doing the same thing, but he wasn't running the poker game. Anyways, and he was, I could see him, I, you know, I'd go in the store to buy some milk or something and I'd be, some days I'd see this big, these big fish. And I'd already been reading articles about my friend Frank Wilner, who I'd get the later fish with, but he was writing at that time the local reports about fishing the Cape Cod Canal and all the big striped bass. And so it was through that and then when I saw, you know, I would talk to Peter about it and then finally, I knew nothing about striped bass fishing at that time. It was all about cod fishing, smelt fish, anyway, in flounder. But he would give me a hard time, all right? He says, you know, here I am, knee high to a grasshopper. He says, you're not, you know, your mother and father gonna let you out at, you know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night to let you go fishing with me? I says, yeah, all right. 
So he set the first, the first time I set up with him was, he was leaving Friday night. At that time, that was the beginning of Route 24 being built. He was a construction, he was helping build on that. So he knew mm -hmm. all the way down here. At, at first, we used to come down Route 3 all the way, mm -hmm. all right? But then when he started working on that, we were one of the first ones to drive on 24 with no road. And anyways, I got up 10 o'clock. I had no gear. I had nothing, just myself. And he's got the rides. He's got a small car. And he says to me, he says, well, get in the car. All right. Roll the window down. Okay. Roll the window down. He says, okay. I'm going to pass in the two rods. He says, now what you're going to do is you're going to keep your hand out and prevent it from wrapping on the car. I says, oh, okay. So by the time we get down here, I couldn't feel my hand because it was outside. <laughs> and first thing, you know, the first thing he teaches me is how to skin a, you know, how to rig a, a skin eel rig. That was the first thing. And then he says, uh, you're going to be observing whatever. And I catch fish, you got to bring them. All my gear you're going to carry to where we go. All my gear you're going to carry back. So and I says, no problem, no problem. So then eventually, because he ran a truck and sold vegetables out of the truck, he gave me a job of working with them again, you know, and I got a few pennies, whatever it was. But the fact is that he was, he was a veteran. He had standards. He knew everybody. Everybody knew him, and he knew everybody. He come down, hi Peter, hi Peter. The, the blacks, when he, when he fished with the blacks, we would we'll get on the canal, you couldn't see two feet in front of you with the fog sometimes, with hardly any light, because they never fish with light at all. And all I'd hear is, is that you, uh, is, is that you, Peter? Yep, okay, we got you set up right here. All right, we got the two spots, and I know where those spots are, because I fished them myself later. All right, and I know they still to this day catch fish. And, you know, and, and some people try to say, oh, that's a secret. <laughs> Been a secret since the 40s. It's no yeah. secret. <laughs> you know, that's what cracks me up. Um, but my, my mentor kind of initiated uh, my spirit that I wanted to follow, because we did smelt fish and together. He never caught fish with me, but in smelt fish, he loved smelt fishing. We used to smelt fish together all night long. I mean, I could fish all night long. Night, night fishing for me is fishing, yeah. because I had the solitude and I had the darkness to think about what my life was already at, all right? I got an abusive father. I'm in a bad neighborhood. I'm trying to trying to do the right thing. I believe in God. I believe in prayer. I don't like approaches. And I, 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 after that life started, I joined the Navy. And while I, when I got on board my ship, there was only one other fella that fished, the ship's barber. And he was getting discharged. And I said, and he was, he was a man of color, but we, we were like this. I mean, we talked about fishing. I don't care what kind of fishing. He, he, he liked it. He left the ship, and the captain asked, and I, I brought my fishing gear aboard the ship. I had a couple of spinning rods and this and that, and I, I would keep them under my rack. And the captain says, Carl, how would you like to be the uh, ship's uh, recreational officer? I says, I'd love it, sure. He says, well, we'll give you another $75 a month. I says, oh, I'll take it. I was just married, all right? And my son, my first son, was, was born in the Red Sea. 
uh, for, you know, we were married, and nine months later she had, <laughs> and I hadn't been home since we had to uh, get married, and my first son was born, and I was in the Red Sea anyway. Says, so when I left that ship, not only, I would say that 75 to 80 percent of the, the crew all had rods on that boat, mm -hmm. on that ship. Because one of the things, and every time I was on patrol, shore patrol, not shore patrol, but, but it was my duty to be on ship when we were in, we were in port. I had a, a road, a rod on the bow, had a road on the stern, I had one in the middle. And part of my watch as I went around the ship was to make sure that there was no fish, all right? <laughs> And one night, and I, uh, whenever I caught fish, at that time, the captain of the boat, the ship, the same difference, uh, I would give it to a steward mate. Back then we had Filipino people working towards being citizens of the United States, and they worked on the ships, and they were mostly cooks, all right? But the, the captain had his own chef. And I would give it to the cook, and he would cook, the, cook it up for him, and he loved it. And so the captain and I were pretty good. I, I, I would have my watch, and he'd come up to me, tap me on the back of the shoulder, and say, how's the fishing tonight, Cal? I says, nothing yet, Cap. He says, well, if you get something, don't forget. He said, oh, don't worry. He didn't ask me how the watch was going. He asked me how the fishing was going. All right, so I, I loved it, you know, and I, I got along, you know, with the officers. Uh, we had a couple of bad experiences trying to catch fish. I mean, we got into France, and uh, we, we, the Mitchell people came aboard the, the ship, and they sold us, you know, rods and reels for cheap money. And everybody started fishing even more because we used to fish for mackerel, especially when we were in France, and squid. Oh, squid is from here to the table. And, you know, you get a mackerel on on your live line and you just see a squid inhale, inhale the mackerel and suck the mackerel all the way in and watch it. It's, it's, it's a sight. And where we were in Nice, in cans, you could see 60, 70 feet, you could see the fish on the bottom. That's how clean the water was, mm -hmm. unlike in some other places. But the, the uh, getting off topic here a little bit. It's, it's fascinating though, but I'm, yeah. I'm, your story, you taught a lot of people on the board the ship, yeah, passed I, on fishing to them. How about I, in, in your family? Well, I have three sons, they all fish. I, and, and, and speaking of that, that was one of the, my ways of getting to my sons. And whenever they had a problem at this time, I knew where to go and catch fish and where to go and not catch fish. And if I had a son that had a problem with schoolwork or something like this, I would take him fishing. And, and we would get all the issues out and we would discuss all of the challenges that he was going through. And some of them had some challenges. And I used the fishing to help me get through to them. And when they had problems, we never caught any fish. All right. And when they didn't, we caught fish. And I explained to them, I said, that's the way it's going to be. So when you need to have a problem and you need some advice, I said, you got to let me know what you want to talk about. Because for a bunch of years, they didn't know. But when they get older, you know, get more wisdom and wise. I have uh, my oldest son, David. Uh, he fished the beach very hard with me. We used to put in 16, 20 hours, sometimes longer, on the beach with no sleep. Um, fished with some nice people and uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of people that some of them are no longer with us. And... Uh, my son Bill, he fished with us when he could. My son Eric, also my son Eric, is a, he loves freshwater fishing. And my son David, he, he was fishing. We, I was supposed to go with him out in a race. And 
I couldn't make it. Something happened. I don't know what happened. But Bill and him went together. They raked. We did all the night fishing. He raked the sand eels. They got all the sand eels they needed. They went down fishing. Bill, David went to sleep, and Billy kept fishing. He fished all the way until daybreak. Nothing happened. He says he left him a few sand eels. When David woke up, he took. He had. A, we used to fish with a high low rig, two sand eels. He didn't have enough sand eels left to do that, so he took, put one on the high low, high end of the high low rig, walked out because it was low tide. He put it out there. He says, and he got the, he got this fish on. Reeled it up. Was 55 and a half pounds. The only thing in its stomach, only thing in its stomach, was a tongue depressor. There was nothing <laughs> else in this fish's stomach. Was it? And that you know, those are my three sons. My, and I you know, I did teach them, but I used I used fishing as a uh, a sharing type thing. Mm -hmm. right? A way to because, connect. Yeah. Right. A way to connect. And it took my wife almost 10 years to get to a point where, go ahead, you know, without arguing about it. Everybody that gets first married and you run into somebody that seriously fishes, you have this problem that you have to overcome. And as long as you know, you know, that's all you're doing is fishing, you know, it shouldn't be a real problem. I mean, I had a few ministers that would say to me, how come you're not in church, Carl? I says, Reverend, I said, let me tell you a story. I says, I can't go and be any closer to God than where I go when I go fishing. I said, when I go fishing, I'm talking to the man upstairs. And back then, then I did a lot of talking uh, to get over what I was going through at the time. And so I, I said to him, so when I come to church, it's, I come, you know, like everybody else does, it doesn't go to a regular church. And I, you know, I, I've gone and participated at every religion's church that um, is out there, from Catholic, Greek, Jewish, Episcopalian, you name it. I, I've spent at least one year going to that particular church. And I still was drawn to going fishing to get, because I can pray, I can pray in any place, all right? I mean, if you believe, you believe, you don't, you don't, I can't make you believe. But for me, it, it, was, it very, was very part of the, the process that I was going through to survive. Because for me, I was always in a survival mode. I always had to survive something. I mean, my father was an abusive person. You know, he did, he beat my mother, he beat my brothers, my sister, uh, and so it got to a point. You know, when I was early in my life, like I was 16, I think, and my father came home at that time. You know, I would call the police, and they would come. Oh, John, it's, you got you got to can't do this. You can't you know? Back in those days, the police didn't do anything. You know, I mean, it was abusive, you know, whatever. And they would just, you know, say, okay, and they would leave. I mean, my, my mother's got black and blue marks on her and this and that. That's part of, that was part of the early times that I had to endure as well. And, and then, you know, I tried to get an education. As I grew up and I raised a family, I joined the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, because my sons wanted to be scouts. I have two Eagle Scouts, two of them made Eagle. And I wanted to, I wanted to give back uh, that situation. I was a scout master. I was also a merit badge counselor for the Fisher Merit Badge and uh, on all of the citizenships type thing. And I even had some changes made to the to the Boy Scouts manual on the Fish and Merit Badge because they had mistakes in it. <laughs> they didn't like that. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I went through that whole process and then in between there, 
as a, while I was a scoutmaster, I was taken by a, 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 a an article in the Brockton Enterprise about looking for in, you know people to train to become instructors, and the lady's name is Ilo Howard and Jack Dixon. They both worked for the Division of Fish and Wildlife, and Mr. Cronin was the director at the time. So I I went to this meeting and when he talked and I became part of the process to spread this out throughout the, you know, Massachusetts. And eventually, you know, it, I had to certify my, I had to also get certified. Everybody had to get certified, including the people that put this together. We had, we had a, a manual, the manual was probably three inches thick. I still have the manual on, you know, every section of fish and fresh water, including the rules, the regulations, uh, the environment. And we had people that were specially trained in those areas that we were able to acquire. And our workshop, which was the Brockton workshop, which Andy became a part of at one point, which I forgot to mention. Yeah. All right. And he was an instructor as well. And uh, we come down here and and I, I at one time I had over 40 people in my group alone. We taught freshwater fishing and saltwater. Un, unrelated to Division Marine Fisheries because we approached them, we wanted them to be involved in it more. They didn't want to have any part of it. But later the program uh, became uh, certified uh, by not only the state, but by the federal government. It was recognized as a uh, aquatic education program, which is what it's called today. Massachusetts Aquatic Edge instead of the Urban Angler Program at the time. And the uh, we taught no matter where it was, we went wherever we didn't none of us got paid. None of us. Didn't you know. We got all kinds of uh, help from Penn and uh, Zepco. I still have a film film on Zepco that I still have. I look at it once in a while. It's an old rotary thing, you know, just ready to fall apart. But it, it goes through the final points of casting and the safety and going through that situation. And we, we, we got to, we got to uh, meet a lot of nice people in a lot of different places. One thing I didn't mention, I had opportunities which were provided to me by first uh, Mr. Coleman of the New England Fishermen, and then Gene uh, Brock uh, from On the Water to do some sharing, which I needed to do. Because for me, I, if I, sharing is what my debt is for my life that I still owe to those that are starting out. I think we have to look at the young that are coming into the fishing area as hopefully having good, ethical, respectful situations to grow the fishing area to a point where it has the status that it deserves and, and, to, rec and, and to be recognized. And it was through, especially my friend Gene and my writings that I was accepted and, you know, for, is the first time I ever got paid for you know, something like that, because I, I generally do everything without getting paid, because I, I used to do seminars as well, mm -hmm. and people couldn't understand that. So, but, um, so I said, that's paying, I'm paying a debt for my life. And I believe in that. I believe in that because without it, I wouldn't be here. I have many friends that I grew up with, that became part of the street. I was part of the street too. But I, I, and that's not where I wanted to be. And it was through fishing that I was able to get out. It was through fishing that I was able to accomplish things. It was through fishing that I, my sons have made 
their life, I think, better than it would have been, all right? And also having a good wife that was able to help me do the writing because I my English was terrible. But, you know, it, it, it's a... It's a life that I have a few more years, hopefully, to give. I'm trying. I'm trying the best I can uh, to pay back my debt to what saved my life. And you know, because that's how I look at it. I mean, other people might not look at it that way, but that's how I look at it. I think it's it's a great way to look at, beautiful way to look at it, really. To give back and you have given back so much um and i'm glad you're here i'm glad fishing saved your life and i'm really thankful for you coming on and and being willing to share so many stories be so open about about your past about all the experiences you've had i think it'll resonate with a lot of a lot of our listeners and a lot of people um so thank you so much thank you for your service your time in in the navy and and thank you for continuing to to promote fishing pass it on being willing to share everything you've learned and, and encourage that next generation. Um, and I'm just going to give a quick plug too, that if you want to reach out to Carl, um, you can find Carl. You're still on Stripers Online pretty often, right? On the fishing forum. On, uh, I get on there periodically, not as much as I did before, uh, only because now I'll let you do it. Yeah. So you were angler one on Stripers Online, and you're also now on the My Fishing Cape Cod forum. Right. And sharing a lot of your stories there as well. And hopefully we chat a little bit about this. You're going to put together some of those stories and come out with a book in the near future. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully I, that's my, my goal. I want to thank, <clears throat> you know, I want to thank th and my friend here, Randy, because I've watched him grow to where he is. And I always said to everybody that knew you that you were a good person and that you have a lot of uh, good things, qualities that you have been able to overcome many obstacles and do a good job on. And, and that's, you know, when he asked me to do this podcast, I said, of course. I'm not going to say no, because I love to talk. You know that. <laughs> I mean, I can talk for hours, all right, as long as my voice will let me. And, you know, is is I appreciate this opportunity, and I thank you both. Uh, and you can tell Chris when you see him that I wanted to talk to him about his last video he did about haddock fishing, but... You got some pointers for him? We'll straighten yeah, I got some out. pointers for him. All right, we'll, we'll put you in touch. You can give yeah. him some pointers. All right. So, so if you want to do this again, and that's fine with me. All right. It's yeah, great. I want to thank you too, Carl. You certainly taught me a lot. You know, when I was first starting to get into fishing and working together with you at the shop, you know, it was kind of infectious the way you would explain things to customers. I picked up on that. And just learning that you see a lot of people in the fishing world are very secretive and they are almost competitive about it and it seems like the more you're involved in fishing the more people you meet the more you just kind of naturally are inclined to want to help other people right. um and that's certainly why i've enjoyed being on the water for all these years you know i, I like the satisfaction of being able to help somebody out with a passion that we both share. Um, and it, it really is rewarding. And um, certainly there's been a number of people over the years that were a part of that, but you certainly were a big part of that. And I appreciate that. And I think it was a pleasure having you in here today. Um, great hearing all your stories. Uh, a lot of good stuff in there. And uh, yeah, just want to thank you for coming in and Helping us out. No problem. Always no a pleasure. problem. We'll do it again soon. Yes, we'll, we'll do that. Because I'm limited. You know that. <laughs> <laughs>